Okay, so let's see ours. So let's get started. Uh, so this is MSC 498. Um, okay, I think I recognize everybody. So let me pass around the uh, sign-in sheets. Um, okay, so today is Tuesday, November 4th, voting day. Um, and so this is where we are essentially on the schedule, but we accelerated, so we caught up two classes because we're going to miss a week. Um, and so we're actually right here. And so we're going to start working on the thermal calc theory. So this is the final module in this course for the longest time and length scales that we're going to study. Um, and so we're going to work on the theory and the practice this week. Um, next week we're going to go through the walkthrough, and then we're going to have a two-week break because I'm away at conference for one week, then immediately after it's Thanksgiving, so you get nice, uh, nice rest from me. Um, this column does not change. So all the due dates are exactly as they're written here. So the only thing that's changed is that we've sort of caught up two lectures here, and so we're going to, we're going to miss um, these two dates and start here. Um, okay, so if anyone has any questions about the syllabus, uh, please, please let me know. But the, these are your deliverables, and these have not changed. Um, so just to remind you, on the 13th of November, your project four and quiz four are due, so that's OOF two, and also your project topics are due. So if you take a look further up in the syllabus, you will see that what you owe me is going to be um, a topic, and so I'd like to have a sentence for your topic title, and so, you know, looking at the effect of dislocations in, in silicon or something. Um, and then a 25-word abstract saying what you actually plan to do, saying, you know, defects in silicon are important for the following reasons. They occur in the time and land scales that I believe I can study using lamps. Um, or if you don't actually want to do any simulations yourself, you can say, I'm going to do a literature review on what people have done to study defects in silicon using these various approaches. I'm going to summarize the results and, and outline the future challenges. So it's our two broad tracks. It's really very up to you. It's very open. Anything in computational material science and engineering or integrated computational materials engineering um, is acceptable. It doesn't have to be something we covered in this class. It could be very related to your research. If you do phase field modeling, something like that would be perfect. Um, and then sort of broadly, there are two tracks. You can actually propose and start or complete a project yourself, or you can just say, I'm going to look in the literature and summarize what people are actually doing. So either of those two things are, are absolutely fine. Um, so do spend some time thinking about that and come and talk to me if, if you'd like, either in person or, or via email. Um, Okay, so I think that's about it for announcements. Are there any questions or queries or misunderstandings about anything in the syllabus? Okay, so, uh, so let's get going. So today we're going to start talking about uh, phase equilibria. Okay, so final module, module 5, phase equilibria. So we did Bash and MATLAB. Then we did quantum espresso, worrying about electrons. Then we did lamps, worrying about um, atoms and coarse graining out the electrons. Then we did finite element modeling, where we're worried about sort of quasi-continuum type models. And now we're going to go all the way up to phase equilibria. And so we finally made it. And so we started all the way down here at very sharp lens and time scales. So lens scales are sort of nanometers or so, time scales of femtoseconds. We moved up to molecular dynamics. Then we moved up to sort of uh, finite element models, and now we're at the very top. And so we're at sort of the continuum land scales, so order meters or even longer, um, time scales of minutes to years. Actually, lots of, most of the uh, things we'll be studying are <coughs> equilibrium methodologies, and so basically you can think about T being infinity. Um, okay, and so what, what is the purpose of using these tools? What questions can we answer with these tools that we couldn't answer with these ones? Um, so that's what I'm hoping to introduce to you today. Okay, so like always, um, in the beginning of a new block, we have two lectures, one on the theory, one on the praxis. And so the theory lecture is probably going to take up about one and a half lectures, and the praxis is going to probably take up about half a lecture next Thursday. And so we probably won't get through all this today, but it's going to lay all the fundamental theoretical background for the calculations you're actually going to do using a software package next week. And so as always, it's sort of not absolutely essential that you understand all the minutiae of actually what's going on but it is going to inform how you actually run the code and help you understand your results. So it is important to get a reasonable grasp on this theory, even if you don't understand every last thing. So let's think about this lecture as laying the fundamentals for the codes we're going to run next week. Um, okay, so a lot of it is going to be phase diagrams, a lot of it is going to be thermodynamics, um, so everybody's favorite subject. So there's going to be free energies and energies and entropies. So we'll go through it relatively slowly. I'm hoping to make this slightly interactive, so I'm going to ask you guys questions. Um, you can give me some answers. Um, and we'll go through slowly enough that hopefully everybody can keep up. So if you don't understand something, as always, just stick your hand up um, and, and we, we, can, we can pause there or recap something there. Okay, so phase diagrams. This is basically what we're going to do. So the global idea is we're going to use 
computers to predict phase equilibrium, to predict phase diagrams. So we don't want to go in the lab and measure all these different points to make a phase diagram. We'd like to sit in our pajamas at our computer and get the computer to do the work for us. So that, that's where we're going today. So let me show you something that's very familiar, first of all. And so everybody should have seen this diagram. So the phase diagram in temperature and pressure for water. And so on the x-axis is temperature, on the y-axis is pressure, and you can um, orient these two variables to allow you to be either a solid, a liquid, or a vapor. And so what is this point C? And so does anyone, anyone seen this point C before and can tell me what that is? Yeah, critical point, that's right. So this is the critical point at which the difference between a liquid and a vapor ceases to exist. And so beyond here, there's no distinction between liquid and vapor. Um, okay, so we are short a computer. So is there anyone that's not in this class? Okay, so I'm going to have to ask you to vacate your workstation. Thanks. Um, okay, so I this should be something that's very familiar to, to folks. So let me show you a slightly more complex one. So as you may or may not know, there are actually manifold phases of ice, and so you can actually expand out this phase diagram, and we have our vapor, our liquid, and our solid, except here we've broken out the solid phase diagram into all the different phases of ice. And so maybe it's interesting if you're studying sort of uh, exoplanets or comets or some uh, very sort of high pressure, low temperature applications, you need to worry about what phase of ice is actually going to exist on, for example, the moon uh, Titan. Um, so perhaps you need to worry about all these different sort of exotic phases here. So we can actually compute these um, because, of course, it's very hard to measure the more and more extreme you get in temperatures and pressures. Um, okay, so let me show you a, another phase diagram. So this one's slightly more complicated. So this is a schematic one where it's in three dimensions. And so the one that we looked at before was temperature and pressure. This one is actually plotted in temperature, pressure, and volume for ostensibly butane. And so perhaps we can think of the temperature pressure diagram, or alternatively the pressure volume diagram, which I'll show you in one second, as two-dimensional projections of this three-dimensional landscape. So this is like a generalized phase diagram in three coordinates, and typically, we look at sort of two-dimensional projections just because it's much easier. Um, so again, this refers to one component, butane. We're plotting in three variables. So let's look at what the projections would look like. So we're just taking our three-dimensional diagram. And we can project it down to the pressure temperature plane and get our standard PT phase diagram. Or if we think that pressure and volume is going to be more useful for our analysis, we can project it to pressure volume. So we take a temperature slice and predict, uh, pro project into PV. And so here you can also see the existence of the critical point, except now we see this classic two-phase region, so this vapor-liquid two-phase equilibrium dome that you may see um, in phase diagrams you've encountered previously. And on the left-hand side, the solid. And so this is sort of one of the learning objectives for this module, is getting comfortable with plotting phase diagrams, comfortable in understanding how we plot these, what variables we can plot them in, looking at different projections for different purposes, so understanding that these two things, which is something I didn't appreciate perhaps when I was a, an undergraduate, are sort of manifestations of the same thing. It's sort of an important thing to understand. Um, okay, so everybody's pretty comfortable with one component phase diagrams, I hope. You've seen this in your, in your thermal classes before. Let's move to something a little more complicated, which is two phases, uh, two components, sorry. So now you have to worry about um, composition. And so now, as soon as you have two components, you need to worry about how much of component A and how much of component B do I have. And so typically, the phase diagrams you're going to want to plot are going to have a variable x, which tells you how much of each particular phase you have. And so the x-axis here is the weight percent of, uh, of uh, copper in this case, uh, excuse me, silver in this case, in this copper-silver system. And then on the y-axis is temperature. So implicitly here, we've, said, we've specified the pressure. And so this is like a pressure slice. And so we pin the pressure, and then we worry about what happens as we manipulate the temperature and the composition of our system. And so on the very left-hand side here, this is going to be 0% silver. This is a pure copper system. On this side here is a pure silver system. And everything in between is all the different combinations of copper-silver that we could possibly have and the phase behavior. So you can imagine that if you're designing alloys for a particular purpose, a particular uh, pressure and temperature, you want to worry about when these things are going to melt. And so you can see here at the eutectic point, if you have a particular composition of, uh, of your alloy right here, your, your alloy is going to melt at around 800 degrees C, whereas if you have this composition up here, you can tolerate higher temperatures before your system turns fully to liquid. And so understanding and, and making these phase diagrams for systems of engineering relevance is really vital. And so perhaps of all the tools we're going to look at, um, you know, quantum espresso, 
uh, labs, OOF2, and we're going to use thermocalc. Thermocalc is perhaps the one that's used most broadly in industry uh, because these are the sort of things that people worry about every day at Dow Chemical or Ford Motor Company. They need to worry about what their materials are, how their materials are going to behave under different conditions. Um, okay, so how about three components? So it gets even messier. And so probably you've seen these three component phase diagrams. I usually don't see them for months at a time, and then I see one and I'm like, okay, how do I read this? It's super complicated. But basically, it's just the weight percents or the mole percents of the three different components are along the sides of this triangle. And then obviously, this is a slice at a particular temperature and a particular pressure. So we pin the temperature, pin the pressure, and then worry about how the system's phase is behaving as a function of composition. And so the reason these are sort of annoying to read is because we know that they're not independently manipulable. And so if you specify the weight percent of nickel and the weight percent of iron, that immediately tells you how much chromium you have because they've got to add up to 100%, which is why we can project them onto this triangular diagram. And so we'll get some practice with making and reading these in, in the project. Um, okay, so this is FENICR in X1, X2, X3, so the three compositions. So it's a different way of presenting a phase diagram. Um, okay, so just one last example, which is um, a temperature pressure diagram for the solar system. And so in this, we have 23 components, which are the main constituents of the solar system as we know it. Um, and you can worry about what the different phases are at different temperatures and pressures. So these things can really get as complicated as you want. So the solar system containing 23 components is a horribly complicated system. Um, and so this is a particular section through its high dimensional phase diagram, which shows you its behavior at various temperatures and pressures. And so making these things experimentally is extremely tedious, but perhaps we can do a good job of making good predictions for them in a high throughput manner using, using computers. As you can see, as things get higher and higher dimensional, doing the experiments necessary to map out all the different points on this diagram is exceedingly laborious and exceedingly difficult. So if we can do this at least approximately on a computer, we've made massive steps forward in generating these things for complex systems. Okay, so that was just meant to sort of set the scene and give you some things you have probably seen before. And so the questions that we're going to ask are, um, how do we measure or calculate phase diagrams? What variables can we plot them in? So what, what particular combinations of temperature, pressure, composition, volume can we make our phase diagrams? Which ones are more useful in particular circumstances? How many phases can coexist simultaneously? And perhaps the most important question, why do we care? So why would we want to worry about doing this in the first place? So I sort of tried to provide some initial motiv motivation for that, and we'll, we'll get into more of the why as we go through this. Um, OK, so any questions so far? Are we pretty comfortable with the idea of phase diagrams? So has everyone at least seen a phase diagram before? Put your hand up if you've never seen a phase diagram. Good, okay, so that's why I was hoping. Okay, so let's worry about how, how we actually make these guys. So let's go back to the simplest example. This is the same plot I showed before for, for water um, so as a function of temperature and pressure. And so perhaps the easiest thing we could do is go into the laboratory and just dial different temperatures and pressures and see what our system does. So we have one component, uh, we put it in a beaker or some sort of vacuum flask under, under a hood, and we manipulate the temperature and the pressure and look how the system behaves. And so that's perhaps the, the simplest way of mapping a phase diagram. And so in these conditions, these blue crosses, we see that our system solidifies, it becomes an ice. If we're worrying about different phases of ice, we need to do some analysis of the crystal structure to figure out what phase it was. But just by the naked eye, we can see that it's a solid. So we say blue cross, uh, we change the temperature and pressure, we see liquid, pink crosses, and then vapor with the green cross. It's a very simple way of mapping a phase diagram. Oh, so I should have mentioned before, what is this special point marked T? Has anyone seen this T point before? Triple point. Triple point, very good. So this is the point at which you see coexistence between a solid, a liquid, and a vapor. So a fairly rare thing to see in, um, in sort of normal life, but something you can easily make in the laboratory. And we have a video later on of, a, of some sort of mutual uh, ether at its triple point. And it's really cool because you can see the eyes, you can see the liquid, you can see the bubbles all coexisting in a flask. And so if we have very tight control of our experimental conditions, we can actually manipulate our system to exist exactly at the triple point and see all these three phases exist at the same time, which, which is sort of a neat experiment to do. Um, OK, so if we were an experimentalist, how, how would we make a phase diagram for perhaps a more complex thing, such as a two-component system? And so in this case, you can do the following experiments. Um, so these are four different experiments. On the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is temperature. And so we pin our system to be pure A, and so XB is equal to zero. 
And so on our phase diagram, we're pure component A, which means we're on the very left-hand side because the x-axis is xv, the y-axis is temperature, and we fix the pressure. And so we can do the following experiment. We can start at the high temperatures, we can lower the temperature, and then at a certain point we will see that the temperature of the system no longer changes with cooling. And so it's a cooling profile. We're sucking energy out of the system. Initially the temperature drops, and we see a temperature plateau, and the temperature continues to drop. And so why would we see a temperature plateau? Does anyone have an interpretation or an explanation of why? Okay, we're continuing to cool the system. Why would the system not be changing temperature? Yeah. It, it's changing phase, exactly. So this is a latent heat, in this case, of going from a liquid to a solid. And so the system is not changing temperature because it's busy changing from a liquid into a solid right here. So we're just sucking out the energy associated with, in this case, crystallization. And so that's why the temperature doesn't change. And as soon as it's done changing into a solid, it starts to cool as we pull energy out in a single phase. OK, um, now we change the composition. So we're now at this brown point here where we have 25% of B. We can do exactly the same experiment. We start at a high temperature. We're fully liquid. We hit this point TL, and then it's, the temperature profile changes slope. We hit this point TS, and it changes slope again. And so what's happening here is because we have an impure system, we don't have a temperature plateau, but we have a change in the slope. And so this corresponds to coming down the phase diagram here, liquid, liquid, liquid. We hit the liquidus line. So the liquidus line is the temperature above which you're pure liquid. We start to do a phase change. It's some sort of weirder, more complicated phase change because we're a two-phase system. And then eventually we hit the solidus line, the temperature below which you're pure solid. And then you have this, this different slope in temperature. And so by identifying experimentally where these temperature um, points exist, where the slope changes from this slope to this slope, and then this slope to this slope, we can map onto our phase diagram the liquidus and solidus temperatures. And so we know the composition. We dial that in. We look at these um, little turning points, and we can map the temperatures. So we're starting to build up this phase diagram. So we can do exactly the same thing at a composition of 75% B, and again at pure B. And by doing that, we can map these red and blue points onto this phase diagram and build an experimental phase diagram. So is that clear to everybody how one would do this in the laboratory? So of course, we're never going to do this, but it, it's important to understand how, experimentally how these things are made. OK, so that's a pretty simple way to, to do things for one or two components. As you can imagine, this gets horribly complicated for, for multiple components. So if we had our solar system with 23 different components, we would need to map out sort of millions of different state points of very different compositions, do this analysis. Maybe there is sort of multiple phases. So you don't see very clean um, transition points. It becomes very, very complex to do this experimentally for high, high component numbers and high numbers of phases. And so perhaps we can do computational. So the computational methodology we're going to use is CalPad, which stands for Calculation of Phase Diagram. And so there are a number of software packages. The one we're going to use is ThermalCalc. I'll give you a list of some other ones at the end of this lecture. Um, and basically, it boils down to two very simple things. So number one, we need a thermodynamic database, which tells you your Gibbs free energy of all the different individual phases and different components. And then you do some minimization of the Gibbs free energy, which from thermodynamics, you may remember, the systems at constant temperature and pressure always want to minimize their Gibbs free energy. So we can figure out how the system minimizes this Gibbs free energy. That tells us what phases are going to be present in the system. And we can get the computer to do all the heavy lifting for us and map out our phase diagrams for as many components or as many phases as we would like. Um, OK, so as always, running the code is actually super easy. And as we see next week, you just load your database, and you press go, um, and the system will calculate phase diagrams for you. But of course, it's not very satisfying to do that without understanding what's happening. And also, when something goes wrong, without understanding the fundamentals, we have no idea what parameters to change or, or how, to, how to fix things. And so that's the purpose of today. Um, OK, and so CalFAD is the methodology we're going to use. So as I said, there are basically two ingredients. Number one are the databases. And so accurate, accurate, validated, and consistent thermodynamic models for all the components and the conditions of interest. Um, and numerical solvers to minimize your Gibbs free energy and compute the equilibrium phases. And so it turns out step two is actually the easy one. Um, there are very well tested and well validated sort of optimization methods to find you global minima for very complex functions. And so MATLAB has a whole host of them that do a very good job for very complex, uh, complex functional relationships. The top one is actually number one. Um, so in order to make good databases, it's very difficult. 
So we need to do experiments, we need to do correct principles calculations to make sure things are accurate and validated, and we need to make sure that they're consistent. And so this is actually a very important thing, because if we design a model for a three component system, we want to make sure that when we turn one of the components to zero and we get a two component system, that matches the different model we made for the two component system. So there needs to be consistency between the different models. So you might do an experiment for copper nickel, your friend might do an experiment for copper, nickel, manganese, and we need to make sure when manganese equals zero in your friend's experiment, he gets exactly the same results as you do for your experiment. So this consistency between the models is very important. Otherwise, you get discontinuities and the whole thing is gonna break down. And so we need to make sure that as we turn phases up and down from zero, we have consistent um, modeling. So we can get these things from experimental data on phase equilibria, such as the experiments I just described. So we can do caloric experiments. We might want to do x-ray scattering to find different morphologies of solids. We can do microprobe experiments. Um, we might not need to do all the state points. We can estimate missing, missing data by extrapolation or analogy. Um, we need to assure consistency, and we need to make sure that the model is robust to the parameters that we fix. And so this stuff is actually really tough, and that's why these phase equilibrium CalFAD packages are actually very expensive. Um, so the one that we have installed in engineering workstations, the license for a teaching license costs like $10,000 uh, because there's so much work that's gone into fitting these databases. And so this software is typically not free. Um, so you can maybe understand this pictorially through this diagram. And so we want to build these models, we want to build these databases, so that can come from fundamental theory, some empirical rules, some experimental data, these are all going to feed to make our models. We can then run CalFAD to do some parameter optimization, some database instruction, and then actually make our predictions. And at the end of the day, we want to um, compare our predictions with experiment and theory to check everything's okay. So there's this very integrated diagram where we need to, first of all, make the model, make the databases, make the predictions, and then close the feedback loop to make sure these are agreeing with experimental and theory. Um, Okay, so we're going to get into the implementation of CalFAD in the next lecture. For now, we're going to do some thermodynamics. And so let me make a, a deal with you. We're going to do thermodynamics. Lots of people hate thermodynamics. There's all these Gs and partial differential equations and all this mass, chemical potentials that nobody really can measure in the laboratory. We're going to go undergo all the theoretical development. At the end of the day, I'm going to show you that for two component systems, you can solve everything graphically. And then by analogy, although we can't visualize it, we can actually solve three component systems graphically as well. And so what the CalFAD methodology is going to reduce to, perhaps the easiest way of thinking about it, so obviously it's implemented numerically, is actually building graphs of Gibbs free energy and looking at tangent plane constructions between them. It's actually a really simple methodology, but in order to get there, we have to do a little bit of thermodynamics. So just bear with me. Like in the, um, the OOF2 uh, finite element stuff, we need to go through a little bit of pain, but at the end of the day, it's actually a very simple thing. So in OOF2, Lots of pain, end of the day, it was a matrix vector equation. For CalFAD, it's going to be lots of thermodynamic pain, end of the day, it's going to be plotting some graphs and drawing some straight lines. It's actually going to be reduced to a very simple thing. And actually in the walkthrough, I think we're going to get ThermoCalc to plot us some curves. We're actually going to take out our pencils and our rulers, we're going to draw some tangent lines, and we're going to make a phase diagram, and then we're going to get ThermoCalc to actually make the phase diagram automatically, and you'll see these two things agree exactly. And so it really does reduce to a graphical solution. Um, and so please do bear with me. If something doesn't make complete sense, please stop me. But even if you don't understand all the minutiae, if you get the flavor for it, you're, you're going to be okay. Okay, so, so that, that's, that's the deal. So let's do some thermodynamics. So let me show you some fundamental equations and, and people can fall asleep because they hate the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Okay, first law of thermodynamics. Change in energy is equal to Q plus W. So what is Q? Heat. What is W? Work. And so this is what Joule taught us. He said the change in the internal energy of the system is how much heat you put into it and how much work you put into it. Okay, and then that's the first law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics says ds is greater than or equal to q over t. So what's ds? The change in entropy. So the change in entropy in the universe is greater than or equal to the change in heat divided by the temperature. And so if you're doing a reversible process, you can turn this horrible greater than or equal sign into an equal sign. And so the reversible heat that you add or remove from the system divided by the temperature gives you the change in the entropy. That's just a fundamental law of nature. It's not super intuitive. But basically, you can think about as you dump more heat into a system, um, it can explore more and more different microstates. And so that's going to increase the entropy of the system. 
and then we just need this constant proportionality, which turns out to be the temperature. Okay, so nothing too mysterious here. This is very intuitive. This is sort of intuitive. If we stick these two things together, we get the fundamental equation of thermodynamics. And so we get D equals Q plus W. Q we can turn into T D S for reversible work. And if we only have pressure volume work, you can turn this W into minus P V D. And so if the only work in your system is you're applying pressure to change the volume, you can turn W into minus P V D. If you have other forms of work, you need to add some extra things on here, like electrical work or chemical work, all those sorts of things. But the standard expression is just pressure volume work. And there's a minus sign because as you increase the volume and you increase the pressure, your energy change uh, is going to increase. Okay. So that's the fundamental equation. So everyone's seen the fundamental equation in some guise before. Has everybody comfortable with that? Has anybody not seen the fundamental equation? OK, great. So there's a problem with fundamental equation. The natural variables of energy are entropy and volume. So DE, TDS minus PDB. So the control parameters, so the, the variables we control, are S and V. So Volume's probably okay. We can control volume pretty easily. We have no idea how to control entropy. It's one of those variables um, that's known as a thermal variable as opposed to a mechanical variable, meaning that there's no instrument that you can go into the laboratory with and measure entropy. There's no entropy meter. And so this can be a pain because it's very difficult to control the entropy. And so typically we like to work with other thermodynamic potentials which have different natural variables. And so the enthalpy, the Helmholtz free energy, and the Gibbs free energy. And so our favorite among these is typically the Gibbs free energy because it is a function naturally of temperature and pressure, which are two things that we can control very easily. And typically in the real world, in the laboratory, these are the things we're most interested in anyway because we want to know how a material behaves at a particular temperature or a particular pressure. So this is just perhaps in its simplest way uh, of thinking a mathematical convenience. And so these are all basically um, the, the thermodynamic potentials we're working with and the one that we choose to work with is the one with the easiest variables. And so that's why we like the, the Gibbs free energy. Um, so why can we choose to work with any of them? The reason is twofold. Number one, they're all state variables. So the energy, the Helmholtz free energy, the enthalpy, the Gibbs free energy only depend on the state of the system, not how we got there. So there's no history dependence. Um, you can think about this as thinking about T goes to infinity. And so you prepare the system however you like. As T goes to infinity, the system relaxes to its final equilibrium state, and it has no memory of how, the, how it got there. And so this is the definition of a state variable. The mathematical reason we can, we can work with one or the other, depending on our, on our preference, is that they're all Legendre transforms of the fundamental equation, meaning that they all contain exactly the same information in a very strict mathematical sense. So has anyone heard of Legendre transforms before? Okay, so a couple of people. Um, so the only thing I really want to convey, if you've not heard of them, is it's a special transformation similar to like a Fourier transform or a Laplace transform that allows you to change your function from one function to another without losing any information. Um, if you're interested, I have some extra slides that can show you exactly how this proceeds. But basically the trick is you take your first your potential you currently have, so E, the internal energy of the system, you say, I don't like working with entropy and volume. So I want to change this out to a Helmholtz free energy, which has its natural va variables as temperature and volume. And so what you do is you subtract off the thing you don't like, S multiplied by its conjugate variable, which in this case is T. So what do I mean by a conjugate variable? It's the variable it always appears with. And so the conjugate variable for S is V, the conjugate variable for V is P. And so you subtract that guy off, you take the differential with both sides, and if you grind through the math, you find that what you wind up with is a function that is a natural function of T and V, which we call the Helmholtz free energy. And so this function, VA, contains exactly the same information as DE. It's just easier to work with. So if you're interested in the mathematical details of this, come talk to me after class, and I can give you some slides about the genre transform. OK, so the thing we want to work with is the Gibbs, because it's a function, natural function of temperature and pressure. So temperature and pressure are nice things that we can control. OK, so is everybody with me so far? Anyone got any questions about thermodynamic potentials, first law, second law? OK, great. So, so far, we've been talking about pure systems. What if we have multiple components? So now let's forget about all the other potentials except Gibbs. 
And so dg we saw was equal to negative fdp plus vdp. Now we can understand this in terms of partial derivatives as s is dg by dt. Why is it dg by dt? Because if we take a partial dg, bring the dt down here to hold the p constant, we wind up with minus s. So these, these two things are exactly equivalent. So the reason we like to rewrite it like this is because it makes it very easy to generalize to multi-components. So if you want to have more than one component, you need to sum up the impact on the Gibbs free energy of all the different components. And so you need to take, in this partial we have dg by dt times dt, in this partial we have dg by dp times dp. So just by analogy, if you have different components, we have dg by dni, which is the number of moles of component i, times the change in the number of moles of component i. And this is the guy we refer to as the chemical potential, which we give this, the uh, symbol mu i. So in the same way as the uh, volume and pressure are conjugate variables, entropy and temperature are conjugate variables, chemical potential and number of moles are conjugate variables. And so it's like you can think about this as a generalized force. And so the force you apply to the system is like a temperature, and the entropy is going to respond. You can apply a pressure to the system, and the volume is going to respond. You can change the number of moles of component I in your system, and the chemical potential of component I is going to respond. And so these things always come in conjugate pairs. And I'm sure this is something we all know and love, chemical potentials. So has everybody seen a chemical potential? Has anybody not seen a chemical potential? OK, good. So phase equilibria comes down to the bottom line is, if you have two phases, there are three conditions which specify these things to be in equilibrium. Number one, the two phases have to be the same temperature. If they're not the same temperature, you're not at equilibrium. That's the Zeroth law of thermodynamics. Number two, you have to be at the same pressure. If you're not at the same pressure, it means there's going to be some net force in the system and things are going to change. And number three, all of the components in this phase have got to have the same chemical potential as all the components in this phase. And so the chemical potential has got to be equal between the components in the two phases. And so by appealing to those three laws of nature, we can make predictions for phase equilibrium. That's going to be the fundamental way we're going to make calculations of phase diagrams. OK, so chemical potential is a super, super important thing. OK, so now we have a theoretical expression for the Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature, pressure, and the number of um, moles of each phase that we have in our system. So that looks pretty good. So what I said before, if we can get nice thermodynamic databases to predict this function for us, all then we have to do is minimize the Gibbs free energy, and then we're done. Then we've made, our, we've made our prediction. So what does minimization of the Gibbs free energy really mean? The second law tells us that at equilibrium, G is a minimum. And so a system will move in its available degrees of freedom to minimize its Gibbs free energy. That's the definition of its equilibrium state. And the Gibbs free energy is at its very global minimum. So if we're fixing temperature and pressure, dG equals minus S dt. dt is 0 because temperature is fixed, so we kill that term plus VDP, P is fixed, so DP is zero, so we kill that term. So the only thing we're left with is this funny sort of chemical potential times change in the number of moles. And so at fixed temperature and pressure, DG is equal to the sum over all the components in the system I times the chemical potential of component I times the change in the number of moles of component I. So the system will change its composition to minimize G. Okay, so that sounds good, but this seems paradoxical. Isn't the overall composition also fixed? And so I take a beaker, I add a bunch of components to it, I fix the temperature and the pressure, and then I seal the top of the beaker. So the system can no longer sort of get rid of or get new components. And so all the DNIs should surely be zero. Is that not true? And so that is true, but the system has a trick up its sleeve. It can modulate its internal composition to break into separate phases if that minimizes the Gibbs free energy. And so although the overall composition of the system is fixed, internally it can break up into different phases if that results in a lower value of the Gibbs free energy. So from a materials science example, if you have a steel, you will know that under certain conditions, you will see phase separation of your steel into austenite and ferrite phases. And the reason, the fundamental thermodynamical reason the system does that is by splitting into these different phases, it can actually lower its Gibbs free energy compared to remaining a homogeneous mixture. And so if we can ascertain that this 
type of structure has a lower Gibbs free energy than the homogeneous stainless, uh, homogeneous steel structure, we can make the prediction on the computer, we expect to see phase separation. And so this is a micrograph of exactly the same thing. So you can see the ferrite and the Austin type domains. And so this really does happen. Okay, so temperature is fixed, pressure is fixed, overall composition is fixed, but internally the system can break into different phases with different compositions if that lowers its Gibbs free energy. Okay, so we can do some math and do some computation to predict that. Okay, so any questions so far? Is everyone, everyone okay with this, this idea? Okay. All right, so a little bit more math. This is where the math starts to get a little bit heavier, so if there's something you don't understand, please do just, just stop me. So there's this thing called Euler's theorem. Euler has a whole bunch of theorems. He was one of the most prolific mathematicians ever. And so one particular theorem we like in thermodynamics is Euler told us that in a single phase, the total Gibbs free energy of the system is just equal to the sum of the chemical potentials of component I uh, multiplied by the amount of component I. So how does this differ from what we saw before? Let's go back a couple slides. The thing we had from the first and the second laws in the fundamental equation was actually had some deltas out front. Had the change in the Gibbs free energy is equal to the sum over I, where I is over components of the chemical potential of component I times the change in the number of moles of component I. So that's fine, that's a differential expression. Euler came and told us this is also true. You can get rid of the Ds. And so the total Gibbs free energy is just equal to the sum of the chemical potential of component I times the amount of component I that you have in moles. So it turns out this is also a very powerful expression to have. So now we have sort of the integrated expression and we have the differential expression. We're going to use them both in a second. Okay, so what happens if we have multiple phases and multiple components? So we just have to do a double sum. And so this is where it starts to get a little bit annoying. So there's lots of indexes and um, we just need to keep track of everything. So let's look at this equation on the left. The total Gibbs free energy of the system is the sum over alpha, where alpha indexes the phases. So we just sum up the Gibbs free energy of each individual phase. And so if we have Austin type and ferrite, we can just compute the Gibbs free energy of the Austin type phase we can compute the Gibbs free energy of the ferrite phase, we can sum them together, and we get the Gibbs free energy of the entire system. So, not too bad. Then we dive into each phase, and so we dive into phase alpha, we zoom in on the Austin type phase, for example, and we say, well, what is the chemical potential, uh, excuse me, what is the Gibbs free energy of phase alpha? Well, we just have to sum over all the components. And so we just have to do exactly this, but within a phase alpha. So we zoom in phase alpha, we say, what is the chemical potential of component I in phase alpha? And then we multiply by the amount of component I in phase alpha. So do that for all the components, and we get the Gibbs free energy of component alpha. We then sum all the alphas together to get the total Gibbs free energy of the system. So it's very important in the development we're going to make right now is to distinguish between phases and components. So we could have a system. And it has two different phases. So let me sort of hatch this phase. Let's call this phase beta. Let's call this phase beta. Let's call this phase gamma. And so within each phase, we're going to have all the components that are available in our system. So imagine our system consists of sort of carbon and say silicon. And so phase beta is going to have some carbon in it, and it's going to have some silicon in it, and phase gamma. It's also going to have some carbon in it and some silicon in it, but they're going to be in different ratios. And so maybe phase gamma is really rich in carbon, and maybe phase beta is really rich in silicon. And so all the components exist in all the phases, but they're in different amounts. And so because they're in different amounts, it means they're going to have different chemical potentials. And so we need to worry about this double sum. We need to sum over phases, and we need to dive into each phase and sum over components. So is that clear to everyone why, why we have to have a double indexing? Okay. So this is the crux of theoretical phase equilibrium calculations. This is really the fundamental bedrock upon which CalFAD lies. That assuming the system is ergodic, and we'll return to that in one second, then all we need to do is evaluate the Gibbs free energy for all possible arrangements of phases and components within the phases, and just take the lowest one. So ergodic means, and we going back to quantum espresso lectures, 
that the time average is the same as the ensemble average, which basically in this context means that if you leave the system alone for t goes to infinity, it will eventually find its equilibrium state. It will eventually find the lowest possible Gibbs free energy it can ever possibly attain. So that's all that we mean by our hydraulic limits. And so maybe the way of thinking about this is that the x-axis here in these diagrams denotes different ways the system can arrange itself. Um, so that's obviously going to be a very high dimensional thing because all the atoms can arrange themselves differently, all the electrons can arrange themselves differently, all the phases can arrange themselves differently. But in principle, we can think about the global free energy minimum, the minimum of the Gibbs free energy, looking kind of like this. So the y-axis is Gibbs free energy, x-axis is the ways the system can arrange itself, and equilibrium is going to find the global free energy minimum. This is sort of a metastable equilibrium because we can actually get lower if it's able to jump this little barrier. This is an unstable equilibrium because it's poised right on the peak there, but a little perturbation will take it down. And this is an unstable equilibrium. It's not an equilibrium, actually. It's just unstable because it's going to roll downhill. So there are an infinity of different atomic arrangements. So we could go in and specify where all the electrons live, where all the atoms live, and in principle, evaluate the Gibbs free energy. We're not going to get very far doing that because we're on the time scale of meters. And so we have to do something using classical thermodynamics. And so we're going to do that based on a macroscopic sort of continuum description. But in principle, this is really what we're doing. We're saying, let's look at all the ways the system can arrange itself and figure out which one has the lowest value of g. Okay. All right, so that's the principle. If we could evaluate g for all possible system configurations, then we could do a phase equilibrium calculation. We can't do that, we have to do something more macroscopic and continuum using thermodynamics. And to do that, um, we're gonna be enabled by a couple of useful rules, the Gibbs phase rule and the labor rule. So has anyone heard of the Gibbs phase rule before? Okay, a few folks, has anyone heard of the lever rule? Okay, so most folks have got the lever rule. So let's do the Gibbs phase rule. So the Gibbs phase rule says is this, and so this was by uh, Willard Gibbs, who's one of the most famous um, thermodynamics. Uh, scholars of the, uh, when did you live? 19th century, I think. Um, and he said the following. The number of degrees of freedom in our system is equal to this very neat and very beautiful expression. Two plus the number of components minus the number of phases. And so what do we mean by degrees of freedom? We mean the number of um, intensive properties we can specify. So intensive properties meaning things that don't scale with system size. So the volume is extensive scales of system size, the entropy is extensive because it scales the system size, temperature and pressure do not. They're intensive variables. They don't care how big your system is. So the number of intensive properties you can specify, meaning sort of temperatures, pressures, compositions, um, is equal to two plus the number of components minus the number of phases. It's a very beautiful result. And this is where it came from. So the number of intensive variables we start off with are two the temperature and the pressure, if we're worried about sort of Gibbs free energy, if we're worried about sort of laboratory conditions. And then we say, well, okay, we also have some constraints um, and some freedom. And so what freedom do we have? We have the freedom that each phase is specified by C minus one compositions. And so why is that? Uh, let's go back to our example. So if you could tell the system to do whatever you wanted by manipulating all the different compositions, you could zoom, out, zoom in on phase beta and you could say, I want you to have this amount of carbon. And then by doing that, you've automatically specified how much silicon you have, because you've got a sum to 100. And so you have one degree of freedom in phase beta. Similarly, you have one degree of freedom in phase gamma. So now imagine we had a three component system. Let's add our favorite element of aluminum onto here. So we got some aluminum in phase beta, some aluminum in phase gamma. So now we have two degrees of freedom in beta, because we can specify carbon and silicon, and then aluminum to make up the and in phase gamma, we can specify aluminum and carbon and get silicon to make up the difference. So we have C minus one degrees of freedom in each of the phases. So we have P times C minus one. Okay, now we also have some equilibrium conditions. And so we have to have the equality of chemical potentials of the components in each phase. So by fiat, we've specified everyone's at the same temperature, everyone's at the same pressure. But now we say, okay, at equilibrium, the chemical potential of silicon so mu of silicon in phase gamma has got to equal mu of silicon in phase beta. Similarly, mu of aluminum in phase gamma has got to equal mu of aluminum in phase beta. And mu of carbon in phase gamma has got to equal to 
new carbon in phase beta. And so at equilibrium, we know that these things must be true. And so in this case, we have three such relations. And so we have one for each component. And because these are always pairwise, you're always equating them between pairs of phases, we have p minus one of them, where p is the number of phases. So for two phases and three components, we have three relationships. For three components and three phases, we would have six relationships, because we would have to do this for gamma, beta, gamma, beta, gamma, beta, and we'd also have to do gamma, alpha, gamma, alpha, gamma, alpha. Um, and then we don't have to do alpha, beta, because by the transitive property, that's redundant. Okay, and so Gibbs just said, well, let's figure out how many degrees of freedom I have by adding the number of variables minus the number of constraints. So how many variables do I have? I have temperature and pressure. I have all these different ways of arranging the composition. But then I have to make sure I satisfy all the chemical potential constraints. And so if you grind through the math here, it comes out this very beautiful, simple expression, 2 plus C minus P. Okay, so why is this important? So it tells you what is allowed and what is not allowed. Given the number of components you have in your system, it tells you how many maximum number of phases one can have. So let's look at one component. So Gibbs rule for one component, F is equal to 2 plus C minus P. C is equal to 1. So a number of components is equal to 1. So the number of degrees of freedom is 3 minus P. So the number of intensive properties we can specify, temperatures, pressures, etc., is 3 minus P. So let's see that in action. So imagine we have one phase. So imagine we're pure liquid. So P is equal to 1. So 3 minus 1 is 2. We have two degrees of freedom. We can move anywhere in this area by changing the temperature and the pressure. So that looks pretty good. Let's see if Gibbs phase rule works for, for two phases. So imagine that we're precisely on this vapor-liquid equilibrium line. So we're saying our system contains a vapor and a liquid. So number of components is one. Number of phases is two. Three minus two is one. It means we have one degree of freedom. Why do we have one degree of freedom? Well, if we specify the temperature, and we've also asserted we have to have two components, that means that we're restricted to this line, and that immediately tells us what pressure we have to have. There's no way that we can independently manipulate temperature and pressure and guarantee that we have two phases. So it's like we're restricted to move on a line. We have one degree of freedom. In contrast, when we were single phase, we had two degrees of freedom. We could move freely on a plane. So now what about if we're at this very special triple point we discussed before? So if we live at the triple point, this means that we have one component, two plus one is three, minus number of phases, three, we have zero degrees of freedom. So if I tell you, okay, you're water, you're at the triple point, you can immediately tell me the temperature and the pressure of the system because there's no degrees of freedom left. And so that tells you that this is a zero dimensional point in the, in the phase space. And so why is this useful? Well, it tells you what's not allowed. So if I told you that I had a pure system of water, um, or some, imagine I had some, some crazy element I just discovered, um, and I told you that the pure element exhibited four different phases, you would immediately tell me that I must be lying, or that I must have some problem with my experiments, because Gibbs phase rule says that for a one component system, the maximum number of phases you can have is three, because you can't have a negative degrees of and so this is built into all of these CalFAD packages to make sure that we don't violate this very basic tenet of thermodynamics. So anytime you do a CalFAD calculation, CalFAD is established to set up to make sure that we always have zero degrees of freedom. So you've perfectly specified your system. You've not underspecified it, and you've not overspecified it. So this is built in under the hood. Um, and it's a good sanity check that if you do a calculation, you know your number of components, you compute the number of phases, you need to make sure you obey the Gibbs phase rule. Okay, so let's, uh, well, is everyone okay with that? People like Gibbs phase rule okay? So let's do it for two components. So this is a two component phase diagram. We have liquid up top, we have solid down bottom, we have our two phase region in the middle. X axis is the fraction of B, Y axis is temperature. So it gives phase rule for two components, 2 plus C minus P. C is 2, so we've got 4 minus P. 
So what is the maximum number of phases one can have in a two-component system? Four. Four, exactly. Otherwise, f goes negative. That's not allowed. So p max is equal to four. So let's see if it works in different regions. OK, let's say I am liquid. And so we have one phase. Four minus one is three. I am able to have three degrees of freedom. What are they? Well, I can change the temperature. So I can move in the temperature direction. I can change the composition. So I can move in the x direction. And I can also change the pressure, because this is a slice at a particular pressure. So I can move in and out of the board. So I can move in this three-dimensional volume. Um, I have three degrees of freedom. OK, now imagine that I stipulate that we're two-phase. So I say, OK, we have a two-phase system. So 4 minus p, p is equal to 2, f is equal to 2. I have two degrees of freedom. So I tell you I'm a two-component system. We're restricted to move within a restricted volume. And so perhaps I can change the temperature, and I can change the pressure. But then the system has to be restricted to change its composition such that the two-phase is maintained. So imagine that I'm living here. I want to change the um, pressure, so I want to move out of the board, and I want to change the composition, so I want to move up in x. The temperature has got to respond in order to maintain two phases. Otherwise, I might fall outside of this two-phase envelope, and I would no longer have the two phases that I claimed at the very beginning. So it's slightly harder to visualize, but the exact same principle holds. OK, so Gibbs phase rule. So we need to be cognizant of Gibbs phase rule when we're making CalFAD predictions so that if we, don't, if we violate it, we know something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. OK, so the second rule, which I won't spend much time on because everyone seems to understand it, is the lever rule. And so this tells you, given two different phases of two different compositions and the overall composition of the system, how much of each phase do I have? And so, OK, I have a beaker. And in the beaker is a liquid down here and a vapor up here. I know the composition of the liquid. So this is P is equal to 2, C is equal to 2. Liquid has composition X, L. Yep. The vapor has the composition X, V. And overall, my system has composition X0. So it's a two component system. X0 is, in that, is uh, describing how much of component B, say, that I have. We don't need to worry about component A because we know they have to sum to 1. And so if I know the overall composition of the system, and I know the composition of the liquid and the vapor, I can use the lever rule to tell you how much liquid I have and how much vapor I have. So it's basically just a mass balance constraint. It says I know overall how much of uh, component B that I have in the system. I know that this has a certain fraction of component B. This is a certain fraction of component B. So by mass balance constraints, we have to have a certain proportion of vapor and a proportion of liquid. And so I'm trying to show this on the phase diagram. We're going to use this in our walkthrough and in our project. That we have a composition of our system, say 0.5. And so overall, we know that we have 50% A and 50% B. We happen to be in this two-phase region. And so this is the two-phase envelope here. And so these would extend out to meet the ellipse. So I'm just zooming in on a small portion of it. And we have our liquid phase on the left. And we have our solid phase on the right in this particular case. And so this is the composition of the solid. This is the composition of the liquid. This is the overall composition of the system. And the lever rule just tells you, OK, if you want to worry about how much liquid you have, you take this lever arm, excuse me, this lever arm over the total, and that tells you what fraction of liquid you have. If you're worried how much solid you have, you take this lever arm over the total, and that tells you the fraction of your system that exists in the solid. So mathematically, it's written here. The fraction of your system that lives in the solid is just x0 minus xl. So this lever arm there, divided by xs minus xl. So the total pi line. And so it sort of makes sense, because as you're pushing x0 further and further to the right, you're getting closer and closer to the solid. And so it makes sense that you take this lever arm over the total, because you're getting very, very close to being a pure solid. OK. So the math is there if you're interested, but the lever rule is, is, is exactly what it says. It's just taking lever arms to compute the fraction of your system that exists in the solid and the fraction that exists in the liquid. So is everyone OK with, with lever rule? Recap was enough. OK. So let's take a 
four minute break and we'll reconvene at 12. Um, so I know there's lots of math, lots of thinking, so let's take a little rest, grab some water, and we'll, we'll get back here at 12 o'clock. Okay. Okay, so hopefully uh, we've had a chance for let our minds relax and forget about thermodynamics for five minutes, so let's get back into it. And so, how are we actually going to do a CalFAD calculation, a calculation of a phase diagram, for a one component system? So one component is going to turn out to be super easy. Two components is going to be sort of painful. Then I'll show you a bunch of graphs, and you'll be like, oh, you just draw graphs. And then we'll be very happy. And then three, four, five is all by analogy. OK, so let's do one component. So you have one component. What is the maximum number of phases you can have by Gibbs phase rule? So Gibbs phase rule, 2 plus C minus P is equal to F. So what's the maximum value that P can take? Three, exactly, because we had f is equal to two plus c minus p. The maximum value of p occurs when f is equal to zero, and c is equal to one because we're a one component system, and so zero is equal to three minus p max, so p max is equal to three. So this is great because it tells us that we never have to worry about more than three phases in a, any one component system. And so when you put up your CalFAD software and you tell CalFAD, okay, I'm going to do a one component phase calculation, CalFAD says, all right, great, I never need to access my quaternary phase databases. I at most need to worry about three phases. So that's great. So that provides us a massive algorithmic boost because we know exactly what the worst case is. Okay, so let's look at C is equal to 1. So F3 minus P means P max is equal to 3. So it gives free energy. The total gives free energy of the system is the sum of the Gibbs free energies over all the phases, so phase um, G sub alpha, where alpha indexes over the phases. We saw that before. And we saw we have to zoom in to each phase, and we need to compute the Gibbs free energy of each phase. So let's zoom in to phase alpha. We need to worry about the chemical potential of component I in phase alpha times the amount of component I in phase alpha. That's what Euler told us. We can simplify this in this particular case because i is equal to 1. So we don't actually have to sum over components because we only have one component. So let's drop the subscript. So we can just say it's the chemical potential of the component, the only component we have, c is equal to 1, in phase alpha times the amount that we have in phase alpha. So basically this reduces to the Gibbs free energy of the system is just the sum over the phases of alpha, mu alpha, and alpha chemical potential of our component, whatever that might be, aluminum, silicon, plutonium, whatever you care, and the amount of the, 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 uh, the number of moles that we have in that particular phase. Okay, so imagine we have our one component system. So let's enumerate all the choices that system can make. So number one, so, okay, well first of all, the phases we can have, let's index them as P, Q and R. So these are the phases. So at most there can be three phases in the system. Let, let's say there's, there are three different phases that, 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 that can possibly exist in our system. So the system has a number of choices. Number one, it can be pure P. Number two, it can be pure Q. Number three, it can be pure R. Number four, it can be part Q, part P. Number five, it can be part P, part R. Number six, it can be part Q, part R. And number seven, it can be all three. Um, so if more phases were possible, we could expand this. So if our system could exist, if we're looking at water, as sort of vapor, liquid, ice 1, ice 2, ice 3, ice 4, all the way to ice 9. This would be much more complicated, but let's stick to just our system allowing uh, three possible choices of phases. Okay, so in this case, it could make any one of these decisions. So which one is it going to pick? It's going to pick the one with the lowest Gibbs free energy. So how do we know which one to pick? So the Gibbs free energy is the sum over all the possible phases. So if you pick this one, you only have to sum over one phase. If you pick this one, we have to sum over two phases. If you pick this one, we have to sum over three phases. Then we look at each phase and we say, what is the chemical potential in that phase 
and how much of the system lives in that phase. So perhaps the chemical potential in here is 3.6 in some arbitrary units, and here it's 2.4 in some arbitrary units, um, and the amount of the system is, say, 70% here and 30% here. So we could do that sum. We could very simply just, just do that sum and evaluate G. So can anyone make a rationale for which one of these the system is going to pick if we knew the value of mu alpha? So imagine I gave you the value of mu alpha. So this has mu p, this has mu q, this has mu r. This perhaps has mu p prime, because maybe mu p is not the same here, mu p here, mu q prime, so et cetera, et cetera. If you had all those chemical potentials, which one is the system going to pick? Anyone make a guess? Yeah. The last one. So why do you think it's going to be the last one? So it's most disordered, that's true, but we're not, in that case, sort of appealing to our workup, which was that we said, all we need to know is the Gibbs free energy. So the Gibbs free energy contains energy and entropic contributions all bundled together. The Gibbs already takes care of this order. So does anyone else want to make a guess? Yeah? The one with the lowest mute? The one with the lowest mute, exactly. So the system minimizes G by picking the single phase with the lowest chemical potential. So why should that be? Imagine that mu Q was the lowest. So of these three choices, it's clear the system is going to pick mu Q because this one has a higher Gibbs free energy. This one has a got higher Gibbs free energy. Um, so excuse me, these are the same. So mu P, mu Q, mu P, mu R, mu Q. U R, U P, U Q, U R, and these are the same as the pure as these guys because they're all pure phases. Okay, so then mu Q is the lowest. So then it says, well, okay, it's it's uh, it's going to experiment and it's going to try and make some of itself into phase P. Then it says, well, hold on, why would I put any of myself into phase P? Because all that's going to do is elevate my Gibbs Gibbs free energy because I'm just sort of wasting time doing that because mu P is higher than mu Q. I can lower my Gibbs free energy by making myself completely mu q and being mu pure q. Does that make sense to everybody? So the only case where this would change is if we had exactly equal chemical potentials. So if for some weird reason, by some accident of the universe, the mu q was equal to mu r, then the system would not be able to distinguish its Gibbs free energy between this option, this option, and this option. So those would all be exactly the same. Uh, the Gibbs free energy would not change because mu q equals mu r. And so that's a very rare case. It does happen super occasionally. But usually, these three chemical potentials are different. And so the system just it behaves like a rational consumer. And it picks the one with the lowest cost. It picks the smallest Gibbs free energy. OK, is everyone comfortable with that? Or why the system chooses to do that? It's because if it did anything else, its Gibbs free energy would be so it might as well pick the system with the lowest value of mu. So perhaps we can compute this. And so if we know the relative chemical potential of each phase as a function of temperature and pressure, we dial in our temperature, we dial in our pressure, we ask our thermodynamics database to return the values of mu for all the possible options that the system has, for all the possible phases, then we just say, well, what do you want to do? And the system says, well, I pick the one with the lowest value of mu. And so, how does that look? We change the temperature, we change the pressure, we evaluate all the different values of mu, and the system picks the one with the lowest value. So if you're up here, it so happens that in this particular um, system, the phase coisite has the lowest value of mu, so the system lives here. If you change the temperature and pressure and bring yourself down here, it turns out the beta quartz has a lower value of mu than coisite, so the system says, OK, I'm going to live as beta quartz. It just does exactly how, what we would expect. Um, Okay, so another important thing to notice in this diagram that it does not violate the Gibbs phase rule. And so we never see a point on this diagram where more than three things coexist. So we see single phases, we see on these lines two phases, and we do see triple points. And so right here is a triple point. We never see four edges meet because that would violate um, Gibbs phase rule. Because that would say we have four phases coexisting simultaneously, which is forbidden. And so that's another way of checking phase diagrams. You don't want to see violations against phase rule. Um, 
Okay, so along this line, we have mu quartz is equal, mu alpha quartz is equal to mu beta quartz, since the system is actually living in two phases at the same time. And right here, we see the rare case for mu crystallite, mu, what is that, trigonite, and mu beta quartz are all equal, so the system exists at a triple point. So that's the rare case for, say, mu q equals mu r, and so this is possible. Um, or for mu, so that's the line, where mu q equals mu r equals mu p, that would put us in this case, which is the triple point. Is everyone okay with this? Okay, so let's look at a cool movie of a triple point. So like I promised you, this is a terpetyl alcohol at its triple point. So it's in a flask. And so you're gonna see ice, well, ice, a solid version of terpetyl alcohol start to form here. So we're moving into the two phase, so we're on the two phase line, and then suddenly you see bubbles, and you see coexistence of solid vapor and liquid all simultaneously. So this is exactly on the triple point. And the chemical potential of terpetyl alcohol in the solid is the same as that in the liquid, is the same as that in the vapor. So a super special point on the, on the phase diagram. Okay, so cool movie. A very easy experiment to do in the lab, just sort of temperature, appropriate temperature and pressure. Okay, so one phase, so that, uh, excuse me, for one component. We just pick the phase with the lowest chemical potential. Very easy thing to do. What happens if we look at two components? So C is equal to two. Okay, so what, what I'm gonna claim is that if we can understand how to make predictions for two components, we can understand how to make predictions for N components. So one was super simplistic, two is the beginning of sort of the non-triviality and if we understand C equals two, we understand C equals N. So we're gonna spend a good amount of time with C equals two. Um, so probably we'll get through sort of two slides of this and then I think we'll, we'll quit and uh, pick this up back tomorrow, uh, on Thursday. So what's the value of, what's the maximum number of phases that can coexist for a two component system? Four, so by Gibbs phase rule, it's gonna be four. So P max is equal to four. And so what is the Gibbs free energy? So the Gibbs free energy of the system, we sum over the phases, alpha. So we look at each phase and figure out what the Gibbs energy of that phase is. Add them all together, we get the Gibbs free energy of the system. And we say, okay, we've got to dive into each phase, and we've got to sum up the chemical potentials times the amount of moles for each of the components. So we have two components, one and two, and so we can just easily break out the sum. We look into a particular phase, alpha. We figure out the chemical potential of component one in phase alpha, and the number of moles of component one in phase alpha, multiply them together, add them to the chemical potential of component two in phase alpha, times the number of moles of component two in phase alpha, that gives us the Gibbs free energy of phase alpha. So we've just broken out the sum over i, because i is either equal to one or two, and so it's just very easy to break that out. So we can write down the total Gibbs free energy of the system, as a function of the chemical potential of each component in each phase and how much of each component lives in each phase. Okay, sounds like a pretty, pretty reasonable thing to do. And we can also take derivatives. And so we can figure out what is the change in the Gibbs free energy as a function of changes in the number of components in each phase. So this is the way we're gonna evaluate whether we're, we're at a local minimum or not, or in fact a global minimum. Because we want to make sure that when our CalFAT prediction says okay, this is the lowest value of G that I can find, you want to make sure that any changes you make in your system cause G to go up, which guarantees your global free energy minimum. So, so that's the idea of having both of these expressions. So an important note that we're gonna come back to in a second. When you're in a pure uh, one component system, the chemical potential of your component, I is equal to one, in this phase P, is the same as in this phase here, because they're both pure phases. So that sort of makes sense, there's nothing else there, so the only thing that can happen is that mu p here is equal to mu p here. When you have multiple phases, so let's go back to our example where we had certain betas and gammas. This has some carbon and silicon in it. This has some carbon and some silicon in it. Phase gamma has some carbon and some silicon in it. And so a priori, we know that mu carbon in phase gamma has got to be equal to mu carbon 
in phase beta. And so eventually we're going to appeal to the fact that at equilibrium these things are going to be equal. And so what's the important thing to remember here is that mu carbon can be a function of composition. And so imagine that you we're at equilibrium, everybody was happy. You start to look in the gamma phase. If you start to enrich this phase in carbon, the chemical potential of carbon in this phase is going to change. You're going to push the system out of equilibrium. And it's going to have to re-equilibrate to make sure that mu C gamma is equal to mu C beta. So it's important to realize that these guys are a function of composition. So it matters what phase they're in. OK, so we're going to return to that shortly. OK, so let's consider two possible phases, alpha and beta. And so this is the very special case of two components and two phases, just to make things super simple. So the system has two components in it, component one and component two. And it has two possible phases to choose from. It can be phase alpha, phase beta, or phase alpha and beta. So obviously, it's going to pick the one that minimizes its Gibbs free energy. And so how are we going to figure out which one that's going to be? So we can just write down the total Gibbs free energy of the system, which we had in the very last slide. So this is summing up the Gibbs free energy of phase alpha, Gibbs free energy of phase beta. And we can write down the difference in the Gibbs free energy subject to perturbations in the number of moles that we have in each phase. And so it's just taking the deltas on all the, all the ends. We have a constraint. The overall composition has to be fixed. And so we're not going to lose or make material. And so we're not doing any nuclear reactions here, so we've got to conserve mass. And so the total number of components, the total number of moles of component I has got to be the number of moles of I in phase alpha plus the number of moles in I in phase beta. And the chain, total change in component I's number of moles has got to be zero. However we, we rearrange our system, we can't be adding or losing mass. We can't be adding or losing component I. And so we have this constraint. So if you put these things together, you get the following. So you are able to write down your expression for G, and we'll recap this next time, in the following form. Just by manipulating the equations, you can collect terms, and you can have something times N alpha plus something times N beta. So this something are these square brackets here. And so I would encourage you when you go home this evening or spend a couple minutes after class, just verifying you can get this equation. It's very convenient to write it like this because it makes it amenable to a graphical solution. And so this is starting to build towards our graphical solution. And why this is really nice is that these weird square brackets have a really clear interpretation. So this says, total Gibbs free energy in my system is the number of moles in my system, total number of moles in phase alpha times something. And so we can interpret this as the per mole Gibbs free energy of phase alpha. So it's Gibbs free energy per mole in phase alpha times number of moles in phase alpha that we have. We can interpret this square bracket as the per mole Gibbs free energy of phase beta. So this is number of moles of phase beta we have times the Gibbs free energy per mole in phase beta. So it makes a very nice sort of compact expression. We understand these, these things are really square brackets that look kind of weird. And so we'll get back to that in a second. And then the other really nice thing we can do is divide everybody by n. And so divide by the total number of moles in the system. On the left hand side, this is the total Gibbs free energy becomes the per mole Gibbs free energy of the total system. And n alpha over n is simply f alpha, which is what we had from the lever rule, which is the fraction of the system that lives in phase alpha. And n beta over n is f beta, which is the fraction of the system that lives in phase beta. OK. Then the thing that I said in the last slide, which is very important to remember, that these guys are a function of composition. So mu i in phase c depends on the composition of phase c. And so that's a very important thing. And we need to make sure that at the end of the day, these chemical potentials have got to be equal. OK, so we'll recap these three slides. But if you just stare at the math a little bit, it's not very complicated. But just make sure you can get to this expression and you understand why you can refer to these things as the per mole gives free energy of each phase. Then we're going to be in great shape to actually make our graphical solution next time. OK, sounds good. So uh, thanks very much for your attention. Um, sign up sheet, make it all the way around. Everybody signed in. OK, terrific. So I'll see you on Thursday. Um, office hours today, if anybody has any questions about the OOF2 project or quiz or wants to talk about topics. Um, and I'll stick around here for about 10 minutes or so if anyone's got any questions. OK, thanks, folks.